Welcome to tonight's virtual program lecture me. It's delivered in partnership with the University of Toronto at Mississauga Experiential Education Unit. Tonight's lecture is Disappearing in the City, an Urban Ethnography of Missing or Murdered Indigenous Women. And our lecturer is Professor Jerry Flores from the Department of Sociology at University of Toronto at Mississauga. We always start with the land acknowledgement, which I'll read. We acknowledge the lands which constitute the present day city of Mississauga as part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Wyandot nations. We recognize these peoples and their ancestors as people who inhabited these lands since time immemorial. The city of Mississauga is home to many global Indigenous peoples. As a municipality, the city of Mississauga is actively working towards reconciliation by confronting our past and our present, providing space for Indigenous peoples within their territory to recognize and uphold their treaty rights and to support Indigenous peoples. We formally recognize the Anishinaabe origins of our name and continue to make Mississauga a safe space for all Indigenous peoples. And a couple of things about WebEx. Um, the most important thing is the chat, back, the chat box, which is on the right-hand side. You can see with the blue arrow on the screen. You can select to message the host or the panelists, share your questions. At the end, we'll have a question and answer session. Um, and so we'll leave questions to the end. So Professor Flores can go with the flow. You can do closed captioning. It's enabled. You can turn it on or off by clicking on the button on the bottom left-hand side indicated by the, the yellow rectangle. Once captioning is turned on, you'll also be able to adjust the font size or change the background color to light or dark by clicking on the three dots at the end of the black bar that appears. The box in the middle with the green arrows is for reactions. Let us know how you're feeling about what was being shared and feel free to interact. A couple of notes about the library. The library is now open at full capacity um, all the computers are open, the study spaces are open, there are no limits to the length of stay. The drop boxes are also open. Um, visit our website to find more information about the library. And finally, a few things about our 24-7 digital services, which are available, as I said, 24-7, um, all free with your library card. Please visit our website or call us for details. Now I'm going to turn it over to Rima Chakra from University of Toronto at Mississauga, and she'll introduce our lecturer tonight. Hey Lucy, good evening everyone and welcome. My name is Rima Chakra. I'm uh, from the Experiential Education Unit Office of the Vice Principal Academic and Dean at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. In, collabor in collaboration with the Mississauga Library System, welcome to our April 2022 and last talk for the season featuring Professor Jerry Flores. Dr. Jerry Flores is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Toronto Mississauga and Sociology Tri-Campus Graduate Department at the University of Toronto St. George. He received a PhD in Sociology at UC Santa Barbara in 2014. His interdisciplinary research investigates how institutions like school, detention centers, and the police came together to shape the lives at risk Latina and Indigenous women and girls in North America. Specifically, he pays attention to how these individuals' experiences are shaped by intergenerational trauma, family violence, as well as historical forms of gendered, racialized, and class-specific oppressions as they pass through these institutions. For this work, he has received a Ford Foundation Fellowship, UC President's Postdoctoral Award, a Distinguished Early Career Award from the ASA Section on Youth and Childhood Studies, and a various federal and university-based grants. He wrote the book, Caught Up, authored 21 peer-reviewed publication and multiple news pieces. And now I'll pass it over to Professor Pro uh, Flores, and I will look forward for the session. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. Just gonna queue up my PowerPoint presentation here. 
and share with you all. Okay. All right. Hindi uh, Ahe, hello all. I'd like to thank you for having me. And with the reading of this evening's acknowledgement, I actually want to make a donation to the Native Women's Resource Center. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. And I hope that with this donation and with this reading of the land acknowledgement, that we can start putting these beautiful and important words into practice. And again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. And I'd like to thank the organizers of the events as well. In 2016, my first book, Caught Up, was published with the University of California Press. In this text, I spent two years interviewing Latinx girls at a juvenile detention center and local alternative school in Southern California. I demonstrated how abuse at home leads these young people to their first contact with the criminal justice system. I described how their lives change once they were incarcerated and what happens when they attempt to go home and attend school and generally reintegrate into a normal life away from the criminal justice system. What I describe is despite these young people's best efforts to stay away from the criminal justice system, they cannot escape what Victor Rios, my mentor, described as the criminal justice leviathan or sea monster. Throughout this text, I demonstrate how various intersecting identities like race, class, and gender disproportionately hinder young people's ability to live a normal and healthy life away from the criminal justice system. And these experiences were largely exacerbated by contemporary and historical forms of oppression like housing segregation, employment discrimination, and the over-policing of these neighborhoods. As I was transitioning away from doing this work and into UC President's postdoc and faculty position at the University of Washington, I regularly wondered what happened to the young people I spoke to. What happens if they return home to the same abusive conditions they experienced? Do they stay and endure this or do they leave again? When they do leave, do they end up in adult prisons? Which criminology research would tell us is unlikely as most youth who are incarcerated do not end up in adult prisons. So in other words, what happens to these young women when they leave and where do they go? As I continue the process of turning my dissertation into a book, these questions never left me. And while I was able to re reconnect with some of my research participants a few years after the book project, I still had a little clarity about how these women's lives changed once they became adults. Fast forward three years later, and I was moving to, uh, to UTM and the University of Toronto as Donald Trump was getting elected to become the US president. As my family and I moved across the continent, I wondered how my work would be relevant north of the wall. As I started to read about inequality specific to Canada and the GTA, I began to understand the deep contemporary and historical forms of inequality experienced by indigenous peoples in this geopolitical space. And during this time, I began to realize that the experiences of girls I spoke to in Southern California were almost identical to those of indigenous women in Canada. For the girls in my book and other young women of color, they would leave home to escape abuse only to experience forms of gendered violence on the street and eventually end up incarcerated. This was the same dynamic for indigenous women across Canada, whether living in urban areas or on their ancestral lands. However, when indigenous women left home, they oftentimes were found murdered on the sides of roads, dumped in local rivers and streams, or would disappear altogether. I wrote an op-ed in 2018 discussing these similarities and connecting them to the experiences of Santoya Brown. For me, this was a starting point for my next project, which looks at the experiences of indigenous women leaving home and making their way to, uh, to Toronto and the multiple challenges they face along the way one, once arriving in the city. To help frame this study, I wanted to share one case of a young woman from Canada. On August 17, 2014, 15-year-old Tina Fontaine from Susquehanna First Nation was found dead in Winnipeg's Red River, wrapped in plastic and weighed down with rocks. Manitoba police later arrested 53-year-old white Canadian Raymond Cormier, who provided Tina with housing, food, drugs, and alcohol, and extorted sex from the child. Mr. Cormier was charged with second-degree murder and acquitted roughly a year later. In other words, he was let go. This mass treatment of indigenous women and girls mirrors a grim, underdisclosed reality. In Canada, over 4,000 indigenous women have gone missing or been murdered since 1956. Canadian indigenous women are 400% more likely than other Canadians to go missing. 
This number is comparable to refugees leaving war-torn countries like Syria, Guatemala, and Libya. The Canadian government has conducted two federal investigations into this issue over the last 10 years. Despite these efforts, they admit that they do not know how many women like Tina have been found dead or have disappeared altogether. To compound this issue, there's a scant body of research on this topic, which means this phenomenon is, uh, still needs further explication. My second book, Disappearing in the City, an urban ethnography of missing and murdered indigenous women, will investigate the factors that place indigenous women at risk of experiencing interpersonal and institutional forms of violence in large urban settings like Toronto, where most indigenous women are last seen alive and well. While Canada welcomes refugees from every corner of the globe, it maintains a long-standing tradition of not keeping indigenous communities safe. Researchers and government officials know the multiple challenges facing indigenous women today who experience substandard drinking water, high rates of substance abuse, lack of employment, and high domestic abuse level, levels often resulting in these women leaving home. Other researchers know that when indigenous women leave home, they're often find dead, found dead or reported missing. However, scholars know less about where these women go and what challenges they face when negotiating the street. As missing and murdered indigenous women has become a significant part of Canadian national discourse and politics, how these cases and the victims are represented, represented in the media has been of key interest to researchers. While there is more coverage on missing and murdered indigenous women or MMIW today than in decades past, there is evidence that's still underreported mainstream news. For example, Drake Fletcher and Voss found that newspapers tend to underrepresent stories related to this issue, occasionally shining a spotlight on them, followed by a reporting void. When mainstream media did report on these cases, news stories tended to rely on tropes of substance abuse, inherent riskiness, degeneracy, as well as promiscuity. These discourses are connected to erroneous stereotypes of indigenous women that started during the early days of settler contact. As a whole, scholars had argued that indigenous women themselves are being blamed by the criminal justice system in media outlets in part or entirely for their own victimization. Ultimately, how this topic is covered in the media has important implications for public understandings and perceptions of these victims which directly impacts the safety of Indigenous women and girls in Canada. Police and other state agencies' failure to address violence against women attests to its systemic nature and the racist devaluing of Indigenous lives and is connected to the larger his history of settler colonialism in this context. I use an intersectional approach to understand the experiences of Indigenous women which underscores women's unique identities, interactions, and negotiations, but also interrogates the effects of different institutions like the police and local governments, and the ways in which they interlock or come together to shape the continued victimization of this population. By understanding how, how various identities shape the lives, outcomes of indigenous people, we can better understand how their experiences unfold. An intersectional framework provides, quote, an account for the multiple grounds of identity when considering how the social world is constructed. Importantly, intersectional scholars outline a set of interlocking cultural and social forces that shape a group's experiences without conflating or homogenizing them or squishing them together. Additionally, intersectional analysis provides an account on how their worlds are constructed in an effort to underscore the constrained nature of individual agency and make visible the impact of different forms of oppression in the devaluing of their lives. This work also builds on Foucault's concept of biopower. While biopower has often been used to describe institutions of confinement or jails and prisons, this framework and the potential effects of these places fits in well with the discussion of missing and murdered indigenous people. Foucault describes biopower as, quote, an explosion of numerous and diverse techniques for achieving the subjugation of bodies and the control of populations. Foucault notes that institutions like schools, the police, and families help disseminate biopower that in turn guarantees what he refers to as the relations of domination and the effects of power. Foucault also shows how these institutions build mechanisms of observation that penetrate into people's behavior. Put simply, 
Institutions like police, social service providers, and governments at every level help disseminate biopower. Additionally, institutions like the police reproduce gender hierarchies, which punish women for violating gender expectations and include being overly independent, leaving home, or participating in any type of behavior that is seen as overly promiscuous or sexual. Foucault and other scholars build on biopower when discussing state racism or what is known as state-sponsored racism or de jure racism. Foucault and Kelly argue that the state decides who is the racialized internal or external enemy. This enemy can be an oppressed group that's distinguished by race, class, nationality, religion, or other identities. They argue that state racism allows governments to choose an enemy and licenses the killing of these people or simply lets them die. Ultimately, the state decides who it keeps alive via institutional protections or who it allows to be exposed to greater risk of death via lack of social services, institutional supports, and larger government protections. Given the history of de jure and de facto discrimination for indigenous peoples, biopower and state racism are useful tools to, for understanding this work. Disappearing in the city describes why women decide to leave their homes, what happens once they are gone, and identifies the gender, racialized, and socioeconomic specific challenges they encounter. Most importantly, this work demonstrates the places where loved ones and community members can intervene to help prevent these women from going missing or being murdered. This project brings together theoretical insights from intersectionality and empirical insights from research into various disciplines to explain why indigenous women in Canada and eventually the United States and Mexico continue to go missing and why authorities care so little about this phenomenon. In the rest of the presentation, I'll discuss the, discuss the backdrop for this study and the research methods followed by my main findings for this project. I will then, then end with a brief conclusion. The city of Toronto has served as a historical meeting place for indigenous peoples across Canada and North America. According to city records, there's approximately 70,000 indigenous peoples living in the city. This is the largest population in Ontario and the fourth largest in Canada. Indigenous peoples come from all over the country in a temporary or sometimes permanent fashion, with the population growing about 25% a year. Despite the steady growth, the plight of Indigenous women and men has not gained natural coverage. The city has also seen a number of cases of suspicion and or violent deaths of Indigenous people in, in the city increase. According to my community partners, Indigenous women coming to Toronto face a slew of challenges upon arriving. These, these include housing instability, a lack of food, increased exposure to drugs and alcohol, or potential victimization. This project addresses the following questions. What factors contribute to women leaving home? What challenges do they face once arriving to Toronto? What are the precursors that lead up to injury, death, or disappearance of Indigenous women? And how can government officials, academics, families, and activists create positive change to help these women? During the research, during this research, I attempted to use de a decolonial methodology. Arguably, the goal of decolonial methodologies and research is to fight colonial rule and to draw attention to the historical and contemporary effects of colonization on indigenous peoples and marginalized and oppressed peoples as a whole. Some important aspect, aspects of decolonizing methodology is the emphasis on local place, indigenous culture, and creating research that is truthful and relevant to these communities. It also advocates for a relational approach where participants help decide the goals, approaches, and outcomes for the larger research process. I attempted to follow this by consulting and collaborating with indigenous-based organizations like Silence No More and Maggie's Sex Workers Collective. I volunteered in these spaces on several projects and was able to help write grants that allow them to access approximately $20,000 in equipment and funds, which these organizations used as they saw fit. They also encouraged me to look into the experiences of Indigenous women coming to the city instead of only looking at missing and murdered Indigenous women. I followed this advice and it helped reshape my project. I also took, about a, uh, I also took 120 hours of training in the Decolonial Education Certificate Program in the School of Social Work at Laurier University, where I learned about Indigenous culture and protocols for doing research with these communities in Canada. Additionally, I learned about my responsibilities to Indigenous communities as an educator, researcher, 
and uninvited guests in Toronto. These courses also gave me an opportunity to reflect on my own Purépecha indigenous heritage from central Mexico as someone who was born in a working class Mexican neighborhood in Los Angeles and how to continue and how to continue to engage in what we call the Jura Peracua, which translates into mutual aid, and, and which is a core principle of the Kashumbequa, or life outlook or cosmovision for my peoples. In order to answer my research questions, I conducted 24 months of ethnographic research with urban indigenous women. I collected approximately 200 pages of field notes and conducted semi-structured interviews with 35 Indigenous women with the help of one graduate and one undergraduate research assistant. Our participants were between the ages of 30 and 68 and were mostly First Nation, Métis, and Inuit. Additionally, my community collaborators shared their interviews, databases, and historical documents on missing and murdered Indigenous women and historical documents on this issue. This new manuscript brings together the narratives of more than 60 Indigenous people. In addition, I examined over a thousand cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women. I examined this aggregate data with the deduced web-based software package. This multifaceted methodological approach will introduce the extent of how, where, and why these women go missing and how we can prevent this from happening. Next, I want to share some tentative findings for this project. Similar to the young women I spoke to in Los Angeles, most Indigenous women experience multiple forms of abuse at home. This often came from parents, guardians, or extended family. The abuse these women experienced was often connected to race and culturally specific forms of punishment their family experienced. For example, Jay said this. That's actually the reason I moved to Toronto. It was because my mom went to go hit me and because she's a residential school survivor. She wanted to go and hit me and my sister Jessica just grabbed and I just grabbed her hand and told her like no more. You're not gonna touch my sister no more because my mom used to line us up and she'd whip us with a leather belt or with the fly swatter, but that's why I moved here. And we left the next day so she could never hurt me again. And here I am 31 years old and I still haven't been home. Similarly, the following person said this, both of my parents are native. Her mom's Algonquin and her dad's Ojibwe, but her mom was mixed. Her mom died after she was born. She was adopted by an Irish woman who was an awful person, but also I can see she was hard traumatized. She was like the 24th child of a large Irish family. She was raped by her brother. She was poor, terrifying poor, like winter no shoes poor. She was haunted by all that stuff and hurt us all and hurt my mom probably the worst of everybody. So there was intergenerational trauma from my Irish and from the native side. In 1883, Canada began the Indian residential school system, which was a network of boarding schools for indigenous peoples. The network was funded by the Canadian government's Department of Indian Affairs and, and administered by Christian churches. Indigenous children were taken from their parents and required to attend with the ultimate goal of forcibly assimilating these kids into Anglo-European Canadian culture. Between 1883 and 1996, 150 Native kids between the ages of 4 to 19 were forced to attend. These were spaces of horrifying physical and sexual violence. Children spent half of their days in lessons and the other half working to offset their costs of their education and to generate profits for the church. Many residential school survivors became addicted to drugs and alcohol and often abused their loved ones. When these respondents speak of intergenerational trauma, they are describing the riftful effects of victimization, whereby, this, whereby the systemic effect of personal trauma often extends beyond the actual victim and can have a profound effect on the lives of significant others, particularly spouses and offspring. Researchers know that the survivors of trauma are often abusive themselves and can be physically or psychologically unresponsive to their children and loved ones. You can see the lasting effects of residential school trauma for Jocelyn and intergenerational trauma for C whose mother experienced class-based and race-specific intergenerational trauma on both sides of her families. Given this mistreatment, the woman we spoke to often decided to leave home. Our participants spent multiple hours walking through city streets, suburban areas, and busy highways after leaving home. Uh, and busy highways. After leaving home, C and her friends attempted to avoid busy streets, public places, and other locations where they might see law enforcement agents or their respective families. 
This led them to walking for 36 hours to a neighboring city across provincial lines. During this time, they crossed difficult spaces like highways where they attempted to hitchhike with little luck. Eventually, they arrived in a small city. After staying for a few days, they decided to hitchhike somewhere else. However, they were running low on resources and money. They said the following. So we got to a town and hitchhiked from there. I don't know where we went. We stopped at a lot of truck stops. She was doing sex work and showing me what I can do if I needed to get cash. It terrified me. It bumped up against my trauma. Then for about a good solid year, my thing was drugs. I started using ecstasy. It was cool. It was a fun thing to do. That's what I did for like a year and a half. Just like party and crash and avoid rape because it was all around me. This person describes the gender challenges she experienced after leaving home and attempting to get to the city. Her and her friend hitchhiked to rest areas and truck stops. And once there, her friend would engage in sex work or often called survival sex in order to make money for basic necessities like food, shelter, or for a ride to another location. During this time, B taught, uh, taught C how to negotiate life away from home. And this mostly involved showing her how to engage in sex work in the safest possible way. But while they were together, B insisted uh, C not engage in this and would make money for them both. During the next year, they continued to hitchhike and move from place to place. During this time, they both started to increase the use of alcohol and drugs. As the use of control substances grew, there was also an increased number of situations where they were exposed to the possibility of sexual assault. For approximately a year, they partied, um, a B and C partied their way across Canada. They continued to, to increase their drug use and started experimenting with other drugs as well. As she began to spend more time inhibited, more men attempted to coerce her into sex. During these times, she would often begin to disassociate, which is a common coping strategy during, um, during times where she faced abuse. Whenever she experienced these feelings, she attempted to break the shift in order to stay coherent and avoid potential victimization. Crystal is one example, while other researchers have found women negotiating the streets often experience gendered violence and sexual assault everywhere they go. Finding shelter presented various barriers and exposed these women to physical, psychological, and sexual violence. This part of leaving home also included the constant negotiation of their relationships with men and the threat of being sexually assaulted, which is commonplace for young women when contrasted to the experiences of young men. For many, especially those who hitchhike, this is the point where Indigenous women go missing. Indigenous women going missing during hitchhiking is so common that one strip of highway in British Columbia has been nicknamed the Highway of Tears. For women who successfully arrive in Toronto, they are met with a new series of challenges. The biggest hurdle is finding housing. In Toronto, average rent costs approximately $2,000 a month and average home values are approximately $1 million. While finding employment is not difficult, jobs that are readily available do not pay enough to afford the high cost of living. For some people who grew up on reserve, Coming to Toronto could be the first experience with traffic and large groups of people that could be generally overwhelming. While there is public housing, there is a 10 year plus wait list to access these services. Some women are able to live with family for short periods, but they reported being expected to cook, clean, and care for their children with no pay. Others quickly started new relationships to find a place to, a place to live and to meet their basic needs. However, this partnership, part, these partnerships quickly became abusing, abusive. This person said the following. I moved in with my boyfriend's family for a while before we got our own place. We got married a week after I turned 17. I had a job and we're just trying to make things work. But then after we got married, he turned violent. He started abusing me. And at that point, I had enough of people abusing me and being abused. I didn't want to stick around for that. So I ran away from that too. I ran away from that marriage and basically ended up on the street because I didn't, I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't know anybody here. Once women were living on the street, they often resorted to shoplifting, selling drugs, or engaging in survival sex to meet their basic needs. This sex was often with a partner or engaging in sex work. In either instance, the women I interviewed often experienced abuse at the hands of their partners or people whom they sold sex to. The women I spoke to endured this constant gender-specific violence and were regularly the victims of physical and sexual assault. Another respondent said this, I had this one guy pick me up one night, one o'clock in the morning, right over there on Sutter in Parliament. This guy picked me up in his car. 
And you know those cars, it's got the front seat, the back seat, and then it goes immediately right into the trunk from the back seat. So there's this other guy that came up over the back seat from the trunk and he had a gun in his hand. They held that gun to my head for hours while they made me do whatever. And they talked about killing me, you know, and they, when they were done with me, all I could hear was them saying, was them discussing all this, like, let's kill her, we should kill her, just shoot her in the head. According to respondents at local news agencies, women in Toronto, or indigenous women in Toronto, are often targeted for this type of mistreatment, as well as sporadic uh, beatings, robberies, and assaults. Men drive around indigenous agencies looking to recruit native women into sex work and the larger, larger human trafficking circuit in the city, which often operates uh, out of private residences, cars, and massage parlors. As Pamela Hart, executive director of Native Women's Resource Center of Toronto said, when women leave violence, they're homeless. When they're homeless, they're put at risk. And when they become exposed, and they become exposed to more gender violence. Additionally, would-be victimizers target indigenous women because of their race, their class, and their gender. They are aware that this population is disproportionately poor and vulnerable and believe no one will care if one more native woman goes missing, is beaten, or raped. These individuals also know that these women can see little to no help from the police and the larger criminal justice system. The history of policing indigenous peoples is directly tied to British colonial rule and later Canadian rule. In 1873, the Parliament of Canada established a federal police force named the North West Mounted Police, which later became the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Colonial governments relied on these policies to, uh, on these police forces to facilitate indigenous people's subjugation to colonial law and to force indigenous peoples into industrial and agricultural economies. As a whole, mounted police were actively required to ensure the submission of indigenous peoples. Additionally, the Crown and later the state gave these police the ability to unilaterally determine sentencing, sentencing, guilt, or innocence, and punishment for perceived or actual offenses. This negative history continues to influence the experiences of Indigenous peoples with police as they disproportionately suffer from abuse or over incarceration at the hands of criminal justice agencies. Sam said the following. I've had one, uh, one spit in my lunch sandwich. A six foot something officer beat me. I was a hundred pounds. He said, you have warrants for your arrest, but give me a BJ and I'll let you go. That's a cop. There might be one odd or two good ones, but they don't care. Sally said this. My sister got raped at the 55th or 54th division or 52 by the police. They don't believe her because of the time she was drunk and they call me a dirty Indian when I said something. It's clear from these narratives and the other people in our study that Indigenous peoples in Toronto face a slew of adverse treatment from the police and other criminal justice agencies. Additionally, their current treatment is consistent with the historical legacy of oppression that began with the Northwest Mounted Police. Canadians, especially those who, pray, who would prey upon Indigenous women, are well aware of the lack of help police provide to this community. This, for many other gender, racialized, and class-specific reasons, is why victimizers likely prey on this community. These narratives also start to build our understanding of who the state with its broad social safety nets chooses to protect and who it allows to die. While women encounter problems when attempting to find housing, staying safe and trying to meet their basic needs, they also struggled with childcare agencies. In Canada, Child Aid Society and Native Child are both tasked with protecting the well-being of children. However, for Indigenous peoples, they have a long history of forcibly removing kids from their homes and of inflicting harm to Indigenous children as a whole. As the federal government began to phase out residential schools after World War II, the state-led apprehension of Indigenous children did not end, but rather shifted and took a new form referred to as the 60s school. From the 1960s into the 1980s, child welfare workers removed Indigenous children from their homes and placed them with non-Indigenous foster care and adopted parents. Similar to residential schools, survivors of the 60s school report widespread mistreatment and all forms of abuse. So, the following participants said this, I was kind of staying in my friend's place wherever I could with her and my daughter. And during that time, like I was still in contact with her dad and he wanted to see her. I wasn't going to keep him from her, but then he came to see me. We met at the Bay Street bus station. So I showed up there with my daughter. 
but he was there with a CAS worker and the police, and they took my daughter right out of my arms at the bus station. I didn't get to see her for another 18 years. They completely cut off contact with her, so she grew up without me. So because of that, I was in a lot of pain and I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't know how to cope with those feelings, so I ended up turning to drugs. This person describes the negative interventions that Children's Aid Society took in their lives. Their the involvement of child services and the lives of indigenous people is so cute the community members often call these organizations the baby naps. In this case, we see how the historical separating of children from indigenous mothers continues to take place with little to no legal oversight. While this took place on a larger scale during the 60s group, other scholars have pointed out that there is currently a millennial school where indigenous kids are continuing to be separated from their families at alarming rates. Currently, there are over 14,000 children at care, but the province of Ontario cannot say how many kids are Indigenous. Although previous research confirms these children are overrepresented in these systems, we can also see the lasting effects of colonial policies in these narratives and how this type of family-based violence disproportionately affects Indigenous women who often bear the brunt of child rearing. This is another issue apart from the ones that we have already mentioned that Indigenous women coming to the city must negotiate. Every year, Canada spends $24 billion on programs to address poverty and inequality. While there are multiple organizations in Toronto tasked and funded to address poverty and help women and men living in the streets, the people we spoke to discuss how these services help, seldom help them and how the majority of these white service providers treat them with contempt and disrespect. Given this, Indigenous women often turn to Indigenous-based resources to receive help. I asked, what kinds of challenges that you face and may said the following, getting over the angry women's resource people. As soon as I speak stigma, I never felt welcome anywhere. I went with their psychiatrist and he's like, sit down. This is my, my first experience anyway. And he goes, this is my student. Do you mind if my student sit, sits in? I was like, yes, I actually do. And he kind of challenged me and said, look, I mean, this is my first time even talking to you. And no, I don't want to spill my guts in front of somebody that isn't a professional. He put me down as violent and nobody was allowed to be in the room alone with me. He's not native and he actually said, I keep native people off pharmaceutical drugs. I said, I want one pill because I cannot sleep. Meanwhile, I'm manic. I haven't slept in four days. Mary and other participants described the challenges, uh, described their challenges accessing public, publicly funded resources in Toronto. They were met with over bigotry that was specific to their race and culture. While main, mainstream organizations drastically outnumber Indigenous-based service providers, the women I spoke to were able to get the resources they needed there instead of other locations. This begs the question, if these organizations are funded to help people at risk, why are they treating Indigenous women with contempt and imposing racist, classist, and sexist stereotypes on them? Every one of the 35 people we interviewed had a friend or family member who's a woman and that had gone missing or been murdered. Many of the participants we spoke to believed that it could be them at any moment and regularly feared they'd be victimized by friends, family, intimate partners, or institutional actors like police, social workers, or organizations that were tasked to help them. While most media outlets believe this issue is a phenomenon that only occurs in rural places or on remote highways, this also happens in places like Toronto. For example, this includes Cheyenne Santana Marie Fox and Bella Labucan McLean. Both of these women fell more than 90 meters from high rise apartments to their deaths. Other indigenous women have been found dead in wooden areas of the city, like Alora Wells, who identified as transgender and two spirit, or Tara Jamie Gardner, who was hit by a freight train after helping local police testify against someone who committed a crime. In all of these cases, no one was prosecuted. In other words, these people were all let free. This, these series of deaths, the large ebb and flow of Indigenous peoples to Toronto, and the apparent inability of police to keep Indigenous people safe, provides a unique space for analyzing the phenomenon of missing and murdered Indigenous women, and how academics, activists, family members, and other concerned groups can begin to address this issue. In some ways, the women we spoke to were the lucky ones that were able to access Indigenous-based resources and stay, stay safer than other individuals who remain on the street, freeze to death on park benches, 
remain in abusive relationships, or are stuck in detention centers. The issues I discuss here in this presentation were also exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The narratives of women I spoke to shed light on the ways their various intersecting identities shaped their lives at home and once arriving in the city. Additionally, these cases provide some empirical insights into Foucault's discussion of biopower and state racism specifically. For example, Mark Kelly builds on the notion of state racism to discuss how every state makes a distinction be between those it keeps alive via accessible social safety nets like the ones found in Canada. The state also decides who it kills via foreign wars or domestically with actions or inaction by the criminal justice system. Most importantly, for this conversation, the state also decides who it allows to be exposed to greater risk. And while living in a country with accessible health care and an ample social safety net, we see that the Canadian state appears to be letting Indigenous people and Indigenous women in particular experience harm. A part of state racism is, quote, the identification of enemies as being outside of the population, whether they are to be found inside or outside the boundaries of the state, and thus licenses the killings of these people or simply let them die, since a part of the biopolitical technology, at least in more developed forms, is trying to keep people alive. Foucault refers to this as indirect murder, in which, for instance, some people are exposed to greater risk to which the larger population would not normally be exposed. Disappearing in the city describes why women decide to leave their homes, what happens once they are gone, and identifies, and identifies the gender, racialized, and socioeconomic specific challenges they encounter. Most importantly, this work demonstrates the places where loved ones and community members can intervene to help prevent these women from going missing or being murdered in the first place. It also points out the contradiction in the Canadian national ethos that depicts itself as a welcomer of all refugees, while simultaneously neglecting communities that have always inhabited these territories. This project brings together theoretical insights from intersectionality, Foucault, and empirical insights from research in sociology, criminology, feminist studies, social work, and indigenous studies to explain why Indigenous women in Canada go missing and why authorities seem to care so little about this issue. Canada is not unique in this crisis. This project will also serve as a starting point for a major research program investigating Indigenous women's disappearances in the United States and Mexico. I'm currently working with Pedro Gonzalez and the Ohlone tribe of Carmel, first settlers of Chino Valley, to establish and fund the first ever multi-nation task force to investigate and find missing and murdered Indigenous women. The ultimate goal is to prevent the continued victimization of Indigenous women across the Americas. Dios me llamo, merci, gracias, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Flores. This is our opportunity now to ask questions, and I think everybody has been listening so closely that there are no questions in the chat line. So that gives me the opportunity to ask the first question. Um, my question is, with such a long history of the authorities caring so little, are there any bright spots? Is there any optimism? Yeah, I think so. So, you know, I, I think, I think just for my, my own personal uh, well being, I've had to Sometimes sort of, sort of bring it down to the micro level, focus in on the actions and behaviors that are within my power. And unfortunately, sometimes let go of what I can't control. So the bright spot is number one. We have had a federal government now that is that has produced two federal well-funded inquiries with a massive list of suggestions. One of these suggestions was for researchers like myself to conduct further work into how we can help support Indigenous women. So I think that that's a good starting point. I think that there's also been a national discourse around reconciliation. And the fact that Canadians are talking, Canadians and people across the world are talking about how we can make this right, how we can get Indigenous people's clean drinking water, how can we get them the resources needed so they can, so they can live happy and productive lives. And I think that's a good starting point. 
And so I would also say that uh, we, we have all of this going on. And then we have an up and coming group of indigenous academics that are doing really key and integral work that's going to continue to point us in the right direction. Is everything perfect? No, there's lots of work that needs to be done, but you can't undo 150 year history in, in, in five or 10 years. So I think that there's a lot of us who are working in the right direction. And I think as long as we sort of we're, we're on this kayak and we're paddling, we're paddling in the same direction, we're working as a team. I think that there's lots of positive things that we can do. And I hope, perhaps in an egotistical way, I hope that this book will, in some small way, help bring attention to this issue, and we can continue to provide support to community service providers um, to continue to, to continue to support these women coming to the city. And and we all know that COVID times have been difficult uh, during the pandemic, or as my students call it, the panini. Uh, so I think more people will be coming to the city looking for services, and I think that there's lots of things that we can do to help to help welcome them whether it's providing donations or, or a meal or just being a friendly person that tells you which TTC stop to get off on. I think that there's always something we can do. So I think that'd be, that'd be my response, but thank you for that question. You managed to sound optimistic. I think Michael has a question. Uh, Lucy, I do not have a question, but uh, uh, I would like to, say thank you to Professor Flores for this uh, very informative, very insightful, very important uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jerry. We truly appreciate it. Grazie, Insigne. Thank you, teacher. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, there's a, a, there are questions coming into the chat line now. This is a more specific question. With no respect to... With respect to government funded programs, has there been any criteria introduced at all to remedy some of the problems? Example, having service providers better represent, reflect the community, having staff undergo training with women and maybe indigenous elders, having consultations, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think now what we think, you know, if we think about how things used to work 10 or 15 years ago, I think now whenever you start a new program, whenever you have what we would call indigenous based services or services that are geared towards indigenous peoples, you are required to consult with local organization, uh, respect the members of the community, elders when available. And I know in the U of T system we have we have elders on our campus who help who help guide and provide input into some of the policies and procedures that we have in place. And so, so yes, is there training available? Of course. Um, do we need more training? Yeah, I, I think we could always need, we could always use more training. But I think if we are to lead with the idea that we attempt to do no harm and we lead with compassion and kindness, then I think we can go very far. And I think perhaps for a while we weren't doing that, but I think now I do see a real shift. And again, I think that's a shift that's really deeply entrenched in, in the discourse and conversations we're having on reconciliation and really trying to trying to right the wrongs of the past. So, so yes, these are available. Yes, we we need to continue to provide services uh, to indigenous service providers and all organizations um, that help to help this population and all populations in need. Okay, Shandi asks, are there things we can do to put pressure on government to affect change? Always, you know, I think that we can, we can have these conversations. We can do this work. I think that we could always communicate with our MPs, local leaders, um, and help, help to raise awareness. And recently, uh, my students and I sort of put together a donation drive for the native women's resource center of Toronto. Uh, and we gathered diapers, formula, uh, baby clothing, and, and we sort of had a field trip and caravan uh, down to downtown Toronto. And I think when we do stuff like this, we can have such a powerful impact. And I think that when media outlets begin to notice it, when students begin to share it on Instagram and Snapchat and social media, then people become aware. And then I think when we do this, sometimes we can start a chain reaction. It's kind of like that a small child who was shoveling uh, sidewalks in downtown Toronto during a snowmageddon, right? One little kid, if one, if one child with a shovel could do it, then we can all do it. So I think that always, we start off by leading by example, leading with kindness and compassion, and starting off by focusing in on what we can control and then helping to spread the word. But always emailing your MPs, emailing politicians, trying to get trying to get meetings with folks and doing it in a way where we um, we include indigenous peoples and ask them what they need, and how we can help them, and how we can be of service, I think is always a great starting point. 
Okay. Nancy asked a question about indigenous based agencies, and I'm actually going to break it down into two parts. Okay. Are they reputable indigenous based agencies in Toronto? And would they be helped with funding? Absolutely. So, again, you know, I think we have the Peel Aboriginal Friendship Center right here in Mississauga, which is where I live uh, close to the UTM campus. We have Native Women's Resource Center. We have uh, Mo Mozambique uh, downtown. We have uh, there, there's a ton of reputable, uh, reputable organizations that that could always use the funding, so so I think I think they're there and I think that they're doing the best they can, and I think that at least last time I spoke with some of them, right now they have such a large influx of people coming from different parts of Canada because of the COVID nineteen pandemic because of isolation people just coming to look for better lives and coming to look for, for better lives for the children in the same way that my parents left central Mexico to come to Los Angeles in hopes that myself and my two brothers would have a better life in the same way that I came to Canada and hoping that my three children would, would have a better life here. Um, I think that there's always, there's reputable organizations that we can continue to support. And I could definitely send along a, a list uh, to someone, uh, but, but yeah, they're doing good work and I think that they need more support. And I think we also need to ask them what kind of services we can provide. We can provide, and I think one of the big services that are missing now are individuals who can provide mental health services, which are so so important, especially after this long isolation. So, so yes, lots of people doing good work. Uh, I would start off with Native Women's, and then go from there, and the Peel Aboriginal Friendship Center as well. Okay, Carla wants optimism as well, and she mentions she's wondering if you've seen any signs like the numbers of victims decreasing at all in the time you've been working in this area. Yeah, that's a complicated question. I think especially because we actually don't know how many people have gone missing, um, but I do see some positive signs in that there's so many uh, researchers, community organizations, uh, aunties and uncles that have taken on this task uh, of reporting, documenting, and making sure that women are safe. And so, as I mentioned briefly, I'm in the process of starting this collaboration to start a multi-nation task force to try to try to prevent indigenous women going missing in the first place. So yes, I think there's signs of optimism. Sometimes, unfortunately, we have to produce the optimism ourselves by going out, helping people, uh, getting organized as communities, kind of taking it back to the olden days where we had neighborhood meetings and talked about what we can do, and then we move from there. And I know in our pre-meeting today, we were discussing how some of the staff members at UTM, how we can expand the donation drive uh, to help people in need. And this could be as easy as someone who perhaps works at uh, a, a large department store or a large grocery store that says, hey, guess what? We have these extra bags of rice. We have these diapers. Um, who do we send them to? And then I think once we have a collective action of people organizing uh, the community level, which is sort of what I prefer or what, I, or what I'm a fan of, being able to see you face to face, you helping someone. I think that sometimes we forget that we try to fill this void. There's so much cynicism, but the only way to feel this need for or a desire for the next TikTok video or for the next iPhone is to give and to help help in your community. And I think once you feel that, then you'll you'll begin to feel to feel satisfied, to feel whole, and to see what a positive impact we can have as community members and how powerful we are and how our collective efforts can always help people in need. So yeah, I, I always think that there's sign for sign for hope and a sign for optimism, even if we have to generate that ourselves, but there's always something that we can do, always. Okay. Carla also gives a shout out to the journalistic work of Connie Walker, who does a lot of her work on CBC. Um, the next couple of questions are about lists of agencies. People want lists Oof. of agencies. <laughs> Any suggestions for where to go? Sure. Uh, so, uh, so, so Mozambique, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that, but that's a popular agency for mental health, Native Women's Resource Center, uh, the Peel Aboriginal Friendship Center, and actually all the friendship centers are quite reputable. Um, I will uh, peer review, get a peer review list of organizations, and I will try to distribute them to everyone. But those are the ones that I could think of off the top of my head. But again, my personal favorite is Native Women's Resource Center and the Peel Aboriginal Center here. And I think you can start there and they can point you in the right direction. Or actually, that could be your final destination. They service tons of people. Um, I got an email from, from the from the Peel Aboriginal Friendship Center a few months ago saying that they needed more food for kids so they can have breakfast. So pancake mix, powdered milk, uh, fruit snacks, fruit cups. 
And again, I think as someone who grew up as in a working class community back home and uh, you know, being from a very modest family, I think that that and also having three children now, an eight year old and twins that are six years old, uh, it really makes me cringe when I think about the, the, the idea of children not having enough to eat. And if I can do something, th then, th then I will. So um, neighbors, I would encourage you to start off with those organizations. And then if you if you feel like you want to do more, you can always reach out to me directly. My email is public information, or those organizations can also um, point you in the right direction. Uh, and if you see me in the community, if you see me chasing my kids at square one, please stop and say hello. Don't be shy. <laughs> you can help me wrangle them and get them get them into the car. As I said before, this is hard work. It's hard to do the research, and it's hard for the people who are actually going out there and working in the agencies. Um, I, I see this constant theme of wanting to see optimism, wanting to see that things are changing, wanting to see that things are improving. Um, there, I'm just trying to read the last question, which is quite long. No worries. Um, what can we do to better support our Indigenous students, specifically those who don't feel safe or trust student support services and administrators to share their trauma? And to help establish that trust and help them spread the word to their communities that these are supports that are out there to really help them. Yeah, that's a tough one. You know, I think I think for those of us who work at the university, I think the first step is, is leaving our doors open when we're there to allow students to come in and for us to be open to listen. So uh, one thing that I found useful is always having, you know, snacks, beverages, tea in your office, something that might not cost us very much money, but um, you know, maybe crayons or, or toys if, if we have a small human coming around. But I think that having a kind and compassionate adult who's genuinely interested in your well being goes such a long way. Don't get me wrong, I know what it's like to be at a big university, maybe the first one in your family to be there, feel insecure, feel maybe angry that you didn't know more things. Um, but I think that I always think about the mentors that I had, like uh, Philip Kay and Kira Green who always went out of their way to give me a cup of coffee or a sandwich uh, if they knew I was in need or to, to give me a high five or to let me know that I'm doing a good job and that it's okay and that things will be fine. And I think for us to be able to do that is good to let students know that we're there for them. I think also, you know, at least at UTM and at most universities, we have mental health resources, uh, which are always useful. Um, and I think that I think that that's a really, really good starting point. And it's kind of difficult sometimes to provide a blanket how to for every individual, every indigenous student, because every indigenous person is different and has their own history and their own traditions and their own protocols. So I think by starting out, starting off by leading with kindness and compassion and an openness to listen, to be available, you know, to buy somebody a cup of coffee or, or share a snack with them, share a meal goes such a long way. So I would encourage your colleagues to, to go there. And then if maybe these students need supports that were not that were that uh, they're not prepared or qualified to give, then we sort of move it up the chain of command and see what else we can do. But as I've been saying, you know, a lot of us are doing the absolute best with what we can. We've inherited a lot. A lot of us didn't didn't choose to experience some of these things. But I, I genuinely do believe that there's always something we can we can do. And as I mentioned briefly in my presentation, like um, my people's outlook, the Kashumbekwa centrally is about being at peace with all living things, not hurting individuals, not taking more than what you need and to doing your best to be happy. And a part of that is beginning to, to love yourself and then to spread love and, and kindness and compassion. And so I see this every day with my neighbors in Mississauga, with my colleagues at UTM and across the GTA, which is why I love this place so much and why I've chosen to, to stay here with, with my three kids, you know, my cat, my dog, our fish tank. I think I have a turtle somewhere. I just leave, leave food out for it every night and it eats it and then it goes and hides. But yeah, there's always something we can do. Uh, and I'm, I apologize if I'm providing individual solutions for structural problems, but sometimes we have to start somewhere. And, and, and then we go and then we see, we, we see where life takes us. Yeah, I'm just going to repeat that line at peace with all living things. That's wonderful. Um, we have a comment from Shandi. Thank you for your compassionate work. This is such a tragedy that is needless. We all have so much to offer. Um, Thank you for that comment. I appreciate it. And Kayla, I'm just trying to read the question. Is that, no is that 120 hour training you mentioned undergoing previously open to the public or was it the researchers? It's absolutely open to the public. So this is through the Decolonial Education Certificate Program at Laurier University. 
and um, they offer this indigenous training. We also have our own version of it at UTM, which I think is available to most individuals as well. But I will start off with those two programs and, and, then, and then go from there. But it is open. It's open to, to everyone. That's right. Yeah. Great. If there's any more questions, you've got to get them into that chat right away. Um, <laughs> no do you worries. have any final words, Professor Flores? Uh, you know, neighbors, colleagues, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time, uh, taking the, what is it, 133 minutes and counting, or an hour and 33 minutes and taking the time to come spend this with me today and to let me uh, share some of these findings with you. So um, I really genuinely do hope that I get to meet some of you in person. Please come say hello. Don't be shy. Um, and I, I really think that this, this like, like the previous book and my previous work has really been my attempt to change the world and to... To, to honor my community and my family. And I know each and every one of you will find a way to do the same. So again, thank you, merci, Dios me amo. It's been a pleasure to have you all here. Yes, there are a lot of thank yous in the chat line now. Thank you for your talk tonight, Professor Flores. Um, this brings us to the end of our session tonight. It's, it's our last program for the season. So I hope that a lot of people come back in September for a brand new season. Um, Final words I'd like to say, if you have feedback, please let the library know. You can go to the website or you can click on that QR code. Um, that's it. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Hope to see you in September. Bye, everyone.